Good morning, everyone. Um, I came to the OGA in 2015, um, and my mandate was to transform uh, access to petroleum-related data uh, and create a digital transformation within the OGA. And I had a bit of a, a hard task. I was tasked with being better than certain other well-known regulators in the oil patch for in a period of two or three years. So I've come to talk to you today about the role of the OGA uh, and how that is evolving uh, in, in terms of the, the energy transition. Uh, what we have been doing in the digital space as a regulator for the last few years uh, and how we found that experience, we, uh, share some, some lessons learned uh, and talk about some of the big things we've been doing over the last two or three years. Uh, for example, setting up the UK National Data Repository for petroleum related data. Uh, and then lastly, talk a little bit about uh, some work that's going on at the moment on the energy transition within the OGA. So for those of you that don't know, the, the OGA's role is to regulate, influence, and promote uh, in the oil and gas space with the aim of maximizing um, economic recovery. So maximizing economic recovery is a legal statutory obligation for the OGA that was put in place by the Energy Act in 2016. Um, the Wood Report, which seems a long time ago now, but in consultation with industry, timely access to transparent data was constantly highlighted in the Wood Review um, uh, back in the day as being very important for um, progressing business in the UK. So uh, if we're going to create value, the central premise that I worked on in all the work that I've done at the OGA is how can we make data much more transparent? How can we provide data more quickly? How can we release it more quickly and just increase the velocity of data transparency? So I'll be talking about what we've been doing on that in a number of fronts today. So um, we talked yesterday about the case for change. So the mood music around the oil industry is changing a lot. Um, and uh, it's, this is, I think, a, a, an inevitable force we have to deal with, uh, and in fact, we welcome. So uh, whilst maximizing economic recovery is very important, um, and uh, the OGA believes it's consistent with uh, uh, the climate change objective, because we have to have uh, energy resources while we're going through the transition, the, the license to operate, the way in which companies are perceived, right, is, is becoming increasingly more important. And there's a lot of pressure on companies to, be, uh, to, to act in a more environmentally responsible manner. So, um, yeah, we're concerned about energy security in the UK, but there is a constant um, oversight and pressure from outside looking at the, the environmental impact. So we're very, very mindful of that. In terms of the OGA's current role, I'm not sure if you know, but the, the OGA uh, licenses uh, carbon capture, we have carbon capture licenses, which are like uh, petroleum licenses. So that's obviously an important part. And we have a role in ensuring that we work with our parent um, government department, Bayes, to be more efficient in terms of venting and flowering, and also to promote uh, efficiency, production efficiency, and uh, prolong the life of existing assets. So those are some important points. I think we touched on those yesterday. Uh, domestic gas is extremely important. Um, and increasingly, we're starting to look at the integration of offshore energy. Okay, so I'll be talking about that a bit later, but wind, tidal, gas to wire, um, uh, electrification, uh, carbon capture and hydrogen production is starting to become, with our, our, our parent government department, something which is increasingly uh, becoming a focus area for the oil and gas authority. So the role is actually changing uh, for, the, for the OGA. Um, as I said, um, the, the, the OGA vested in 2016 and became an arms length body uh, of, of Bayes. And we put in place, one of, the, one of the central points about this story is having the appropriate regulatory levers in order to ensure that data is made transparent. So we have obligations in primary legislation, 
in, in the Energy Act, and we brought in last year new regulations, secondary legislation, to ensure that data, a wider swathe of data, is reported to the OGA and disclosed, published more quickly. So, for example, um, well data is published two years from the completion of a well. Right, it's, it's, it's speeded up and, it, and it's a lot quicker than some other countries. Value added data for a well, two years. In some countries in Northwest Europe, that's 25 years. Okay, so it's a, it's a big step forward. So we needed, every regulator must have these uh, abilities to um, obtain data, publish it, and use that as a key value driver. So that's a, a very important point. We then started looking at uh, technology transformation. It seems like small things, but uh, having a new website, uh, which is, is very, very widely used, and creating a, an open data portal uh, based on Esri technology in the cloud, right, for providing geospatial data and publishing geospatial data. And that is very, very widely used. And we did some other things, you know, building an economic model for the whole of the North Sea based on Palantir, every installation, pipeline, terminal, field, is then that economic model so we can truly understand when we're talking about regulation, production, decommissioning, and so on, the full uh, value life cycle. Just recently, in, in February, we launched UK National Data Repository, which I'll be talking about today. So we didn't really have one in the UK before, wrestling on appropriate legislation. So we see that as a big, uh, another lever we can actually use for the reporting of data and sustainable data management in the UK. And now we're starting to consider, um, we, we, we're starting to consider the way forward in terms of our future digital strategy because things are moving so quickly. We had our information ma management strategy we published in 2015. We're now reviewing where we are. And I think that cycle of constantly reviewing and improving is going to continue. So we, we've become, I think, a bit of a catalyst for digital change. And I think certainly things have moved forward a lot faster uh, across the basin uh, than they have done. And uh, Gillian White from the OGTC is going to be speaking later about the work at the OGTC, where there's some absolutely fantastic work on many fronts happening there too. And I, I was at Offshore Europe recently, and um, uh, data was on everyone's lips. A few years ago, it wasn't. So the, the whole mood music has actually changed. So we had some very good illustration of the value of data there. The, the government digital strategy published in 2017 thought it's going to be worth 241 billion between 2015 and 2020. But when you look at the, 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 the four or five largest, biggest companies in the world, they're no longer oil companies. They're data companies, Amazon, Microsoft, okay? So people have realized and cottoned on to the value of data. And I think the oil industry is starting to do that. And although, you know, I think all of you in this room have been involved in, you know, high performance computing, uh, seismic processing and so on and so forth, the actual velocity of change now is much, much quicker in the digital space. And governments have realized the value for, for society that can be obtained from digitalization and data. So uh, it's a great story, I think, and we're seeing a lot of impact across uh, the, the whole basin. So in terms of our, our digital strategy, which we're thinking about at the moment, and hopefully we'll publish soon, uh, people, um, skills, and culture features actually quite highly. So you know, we're talking about technology, but we're also talking about people, skills, and cultures being critically important to the delivery of transformation. So within our own organization, we have digital champions, we have a digital academy to improve skills, and we are very big on more agile ways of working as opposed to linear project management. Much more rapid development of new products, um, more iterations, right? Trying to get rid of that fear of failure because we're gonna fail small sometimes, but we wanna keep the bigger picture in mind and be persistent. Um, of course, we want to use our regulations and new facilities like the NDR to actually make data more transparent. And we're considering how we can evolve the digital energy platform of the OGA, encompassing energy transition as well, and make that much more efficient. And uh, the UK government has been cloud first since uh, 2013, which may come as a surprise to some of you. But cloud technology, seismic in the cloud, all of that is going to play a part too. The technology is going to play uh, a big part. 
So the National Data Repository, um, this, uh, this facility is open to all. It was the, probably the largest release of um, geoscience data in the world ever at one time. And we deliberately decided to make it free at the point of use. Um, and it is a critical, we think of it as a critical piece of digital national infrastructure. And right now it's a, it's a good, it's a stable system, but we're looking how to evolve that and move it to the next level of technology. So we've seen the number of user base increase um, by two or three times, the number of users, and the pattern of usage of our data by opening it up has changed as well. I think we have John Underhill in the audience somewhere here today. Over here, John, uh, academia are using it uh, quite a lot and getting the benefits as we're pushing more data out and making it more accessible. Uh, supply chain, seeing a lot of people in the supply chain using our data for uh, uh, production uh, and doing advanced well work. A lot of this stuff is confidential, but I see at the moment is kind of embryonic, but that work is ongoing. And Gillian will talk, Gillian White of the OGTC will be talking a little bit about that later, okay? So we have a good basis on which to build. And part of the future is going to be using, we're collaborating with industry, but using our regulatory powers to make sure uh, the data which is currently missing and needed to extract value is actually reported to the National Data Repository. So I'm mean, just stressing the value bit. We're not just going after anything, um, but we're talking now about we, how we fill the holes. So we know, for example, seismic data in the UK, field seismic data specifically, has been massively underreported. So we're starting to focus very carefully on how tech, we can use technology, for example, technology seismic in the cloud, to actually liberate that data and make it available much, much quicker and in smarter ways as well. So that is a new facility uh, which we have, have done. And the benefits, obviously, long-term digital curation of a national asset is, 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 is clear, but how we actually maximize the value of that data and how we collaborate on it. Ariel Flores came along to the launch and he was talking uh, about uh, the value of data. And we're seeing now um, a lot of industry leaders have clearly uh, cottoned on and got very much aligned to the value of data, which perhaps wasn't the case a few years ago, where it's more regarded as a a kind of a GNA cost and an overhead. So the data is now being seen as something much more central to what we're doing. Open data. Um, it says here we have 94, 99 million hits on our spatial data server. I contacted our GIS people a couple of days ago. It's 120 million hits. It's by far the biggest area of data in the OGA was accessed by the public academia and supply chain. And we publish quite a wide range uh, of products in here from well header information, uh, production, licenses, all sorts of stuff is actually available on the open data portal. So, you know, the, the science of where using GIS technology is an important part of the fabric of what we actually do. And this data is being used by quite a lot of companies and organizations who are streaming the data through APIs directly into their corporate databases. And I, I don't think Shell will mind if I say that Shell is one of those companies, for example, that does that. And we, we talk quite often to Shell about how they're using the data and how we can improve uh, our open data platform. Um, data collection and analysis. Uh, one of the key things that the OGA does, it has a, a stewardship process. So one of the recommendations of the Wood Review was that the stewardship of oil and gas resources should be tightened up and managed in a much more proactive way. So we do a, a digital stewardship report uh, once a year, but consolidated many surveys in the past that were conducted by different people, looking at exploration, technology, decommissioning, costs, a whole range of activities. So um, licensees, uh, do that, and that's the feedstock, really, for how we how we review and benchmark, and in a collaborative way with industry uh, performance and produce analysis. So we are aiming to produce accessible digital content from this sort of survey information and the other reporting tools and applications we have in the OGI. So uh, it's is the uh, human element of this. Sitting behind this is a team of analysts who are working constantly screening data and producing reports 
on various facets, for example, Wales technology. And, and some of you may have even read those reports. Um, the benchmarking, production efficiency, cost, uh, seismic compliance, collaboration, and sector insights uh, are something we're, we're quite proud of in the OJ. And again, that comes from a stewardship process and our unique ability to use regulatory powers to gather large waves of data and integrate those data. And that, that process of integration of data and analysis of data is constantly evolving, right? And it relies, of course, on good data quality. Data quality doesn't go away just because we have smarter tools. Some of those disciplines about data quality are still there. So we use this to actually drive performance. So we have reviews with the tier zero companies at the top, I forget, it's about 22 companies in the UK. The MDs come in and we review a whole load of performance metrics from data we're harvesting through our digital stewardship survey. And that process, the feedback we're getting from that is that process is working very well for all and delivers really deep insight from authoritative data. So in terms of the, the, um, the, the digital platform users, the, the NDR, our website, and uh, Open Data Portal and so on, there are only 11 countries in the world who don't actually use that data. So we run uh, analytics on that. We look at who's actually using our data. So we've got very, very wide coverage of data and uh, very intense activity. And I, I call it the insatiable first for data. And this didn't used to be the case a few years ago. Not that much data was published digitally by government in the UK uh, on oil and gas. Now the whole scene has actually changed. And when we look at the pattern of that usage, we see that it's going up and up and up. And on particular events like licensing rounds, we see the big spikes. So it's not tailing off, it's continued to accelerate. And you'll see those, those troughs there, that's Christmas Day but people are probably looking at Mary Poppins and Die Hard Movers having a break from our data, so why not? So yeah, the trend is going up constantly. Benefits, well, I think um, one of the big benefits is asset stewardship, the way in which data is used by academia, supply chain, and industry in a, in a much more transparent way. Uh, we're seeing much better regulatory compliance because people are culturally aligned to uh, the, the publication of data and meeting both regulatory requirements and collaborating on data more. So in the last six months, for example, we've seen a 20% increase in the amount of well data within the National Data Repository for additional reporting. And we expect seismic data to be a very big uh, feature going forward. So there are a number of metrics we have used. I'd highlight, for example, environmental. You know, we use our stewardship data and other data that we have uh, for making decisions on cessation of production, decommissioning, and we try and flange up that decommissioning process and COP process and consider the carbon capture elements of that too. So um, we are determined to push on in terms of the digital platform. Lessons learned, uh, culture, organizational culture, like any major change program, is actually absolutely criti critically important. Uh, what I found is that uh, senior managers get it, the people at the coalface get it, but um, middle managers struggle with it more. And it may be that the changing business model and changing way of working, a more agile way of working, that perhaps the younger generation used to is more of a challenge for middle managers. So there's something to think about there too. Uh, coming on to the energy transition, uh, gas to wire, um, offshore electrification, carbon capture, and hydrogen production. So we're, we're actually starting to look at this. And there are analogs. If you look at wind production uh, in the UK, uh, it's a pretty good story. It started off as a very expensive thing, uh, but now the, the, the price point has come a, a lot lower. And uh, the OGA is currently doing a study uh, headed up by my colleague uh, Carlo Procaccini, our, our technology manager in the OGA, with, the, with Bayes, the Crown Estate and North John, uh, looking at... Um, UKCS energy integration. I've only seen a little bit of this work, but it's actually very, very exciting taking a more integrated and collaborative approach about how oil and gas interacts right, with, with uh, renewables. So uh, watch this space. I think there's gonna be a lot of work going on in that area. And I think that it presents huge possibilities for geoscientists 
actually. You know, when you look at the way, uh, I think this was talked about yesterday, uh, carbon is stored, hydrogen is stored, uh, seals, uh, migration, how do you monitor it, what sort of seismic do you need? Do you need uh, ocean bottom nodes to actually monitor this? Right? There is a whole work face potentially opening up in this area, which is very exciting and I think is actually uh, gathering pace very quickly. So the future. Um, I think data has been underutilized in the UK, which may be a bit counterintuitive because we've been spending the last few decades pouring over workstations. Uh, and uh, I think that the, the value of data now is being much more greatly appreciated and new techniques are being used. I think which Gillian is gonna talk about in a minute. But uh, what I would like is feedback uh, from you and from industry and to work together with us on the next iteration of a digital platform and services that we provide to help maximize economic recovery and the energy transition. Thank you very much.